All right, so we got a little bit um, more hypothesis testing stuff to finish up today, and then we'll, uh, I'll kind of introduce the idea of linear regression. So I posted um, kind of the last Learn Smart assignment. Um, it'll be on linear regression, so that's, we'll kind of, I'll introduce it today, and, and then class on Monday we'll talk about it, and then kind of classes after, after Thanksgiving we'll talk about it as well. So it's kind of the last topic that we're going to go over, but today let's finish up kind of hypothesis testing. Also that uh, Learn Smart is due by the end of the day Monday. So just kind of get on and get it done today or this weekend or any time on Monday. Um, should be kind of those, those easy points. It's just kind of going through it. Okay, so we left off last class kind of talking about these match pair ideas. And this is where we had like 10 workers. We had their before and after productivity. We then looked at what the difference in each worker's productivity was, and then found the average difference, right? Or the mean difference. So once we found that mean difference, we can then build a confidence interval, but we said it looks just like how we built a confidence interval when we were finding just a sample mean for one population. It's actually no different, right? Once we've created this new difference variable, everything's exactly the same. So we'll run through a couple examples. So, Let's say we have that, that manager, she has those 10 workers and finds that the average difference in productivity was 8.5 units, right? Whatever that unit so, of what they were sell, selling was, a variance of 121. And we're gonna to try to find the 95% confidence interval. So just like with one population examples, when we only have a sample variance, right? What distribution do we need to be using? We only have a sample variance, we use the student T. Okay. So we go back to being able to use a student T distribution. Our degrees of freedom, because we have only one population, we're back to we can use that n minus one, not that kind of crazy equation. When we're looking for the difference in, in means where we only had sample variances. So our alpha here at the 95% confidence interval will be 0.05. But remember, we want alpha over two on each side of our interval. So we'll look up the T value that gives us alpha over two. So our alpha was 0.05, divide that by two, 0 0.025. And then it's just a matter of kind of plugging things in, right? So I had a sample size of 10, 10 workers. If we go back to last class, um, we had 10 workers, so many degrees of freedom would be nine. And you can kind of see what it's gonna be there, but I'll show you how we would find it. All right, we go all the way up here, 0 0.025, that was alpha over two, how much we want on each side of our confidence interval. Degrees of freedom of nine, 2.262, okay? So now that we have that T value, it's really just a matter of plugging everything into our lower and upper bound equations, right? So here's our lower bound, we subtract that margin of error, upper bound, we add it, get everything plugged in, and we get our lower and upper bound here. So here, with the 95% confidence, I can say that the true kind of change or the true difference in worker productivity is only positive values, right? So this would be something I could say, I don't know, whatever this workstation change or layout or layout change or something, however, whatever I said it was, you know, whatever change was made had a positive effect, right? Because the true difference, the true change in productivity for each worker is somewhere in this range and they're all positive values, okay? Any questions on any of that? Probably go through this conference a little bit quick. I mean, it's really very, I mean, almost identical to what we were doing before, kind of the last exam even, with one population. Sample mean examples where we only have a sample variance. We're still finding a sample mean, it's just that we're finding the mean of this new difference variable that we, we created. So the interpretation is a little different, okay? So we can do I don't know, hypothesis testing as well. Right? So it's going to look exactly the same. It's just now we have this assumed true difference. Right? And the nice thing with these matched pairs examples is just like when we had all the other two population examples, I'm always going to kind of keep this at um, zero. Right? And that makes a lot of sense. We want to know, you know, in the last example, is the change in productivity positive? Is it negative? Right? Did it go up? Did it go down? Or did it not change at all? Right, or did it, did it change, right? We don't care which direction it changed, right? So we still have our kind of 
oops, did I have it? No, I've been putting all things in here, but right, we have this two-tailed test and we have our right and our left-tailed test. It's exactly the same as what we had before, okay? So nothing really new here. Our test statistical equation, if you remember what we were doing with one population example, is this. So we're going to sample variance with a t statistic. We're going to have a t statistic again because we only have a sample variance. And it should look almost identical. It's just that we have to notate that instead of looking at just one variable, like the mean of a variable, we're looking at the mean of this variable we created, which was the difference between something, typically a, a before and after time period. Now I said if we kind of use zero here, right, this actually becomes even easier. Right. Just did we see a change or did we not? This would make that a lot, quite a bit easier. Okay. Any questions on that one? Shouldn't be too bad. So we've got our test statistical equation now. We can do some hypothesis testing. Right. So let's say that same example, I want to do a hypothesis test, right? Well, I've got that sample difference, sample mean difference. I've got my variance of that difference variable. My sample size was 10, if we recall. If I use that value of zero, right, if I just say, was there a change in workstation layout, right, and plug everything in here, I get my test statistic of about 2.44. Once again, once we identify the correct test statistical equation, it's really just a matter of getting our values plugged in, right? And the only one that's kind of tough might be this assumed true difference, which I said, you know, just like the two population examples, we're always going to use zero here. Okay. Any questions on that one? I don't have this like completely set up. I'm just kind of showing you what how the test statistic will be calculated in that example. Okay. So now we'll work through one more example. We'll do the confidence interval and we'll do kind of a more uh, detailed hypothesis test. Right? But the hypothesis test, nothing changes from what we were doing before. So let's say I want to see, you know, Starbucks starts posting their, their calories on their menu. And, you know, I want to see, you know, what was the change in kind of consumption for people at Starbucks. So I have 40 Starbucks cardholders. I look at their before and after kind of calorie consumption after, you know, before and after uh, Starbucks posted the calorie information. And I find that the kind of mean difference across these 40 cardholders is 2.1. The variance is 64 and I want to build a 99% confidence. Interval. Well, first of all, we know that it's going to be built, our confidence interval will be built around whatever sample statistic we found, right? So we're gonna start at 2.1, go a certain number of standard deviations to the left, certain number to the right to build our low and upper bound. But it looks like 2.1 is kind of exactly in the middle of all these. So there's nothing we can really rule out as like a, a definite wrong answer. Okay. From here, what's our alpha? 99% so confidence interval, alpha is just 0 0.01. We remember when we find that T value that we need, whoops, I'll go back here for a second. Just look at the general equation. To find that T value, we need to divide alpha by two. So 0 0.01 divided by two is 0 0.005. My degrees of freedom is N minus one. So when I had 40 oops, Starbucks card holders, my degrees of freedom would be 39. So we go here, 0 0.005, that was the area I wanted on each side of my interval. That was alpha of 0 0.01 divided by two. Scroll down till I find my degrees of freedom of 39, 39, 2.708. So that's that T value that I need to use, 2.708. Okay. And then from there, it's just a matter of kind of plugging everything in. Plug in our sample mean difference, plug in that T value we looked up, plug in the variance and the sample size. Okay. So here with this confidence interval, negative 1.3 to 5.53, so negative 1.3 to 5.5. So let's think about this. With 99% confidence, what can I say? Remember, I'm thinking about, I'm building a confidence of what that true difference was in calorie consumption. Well, the true difference could be negative, could be positive, or it could be zero. Zero would imply that it didn't change at all. Right? 
So here with 99% confidence, I can't really say anything. I can say I don't know for sure whether or not calorie consumption went up, down, or stayed the same based off the sample evidence I found. So if we think about what if I had found a higher sample difference, right? So what if my confidence interval wasn't centered around 2.1? Well, the amount that I would go to the left and the right wouldn't change at all, as long as my, my sample variance, my sample size didn't change. And so really the only way I can kind of have all positive values if I see a sample difference that's, you know, much, much higher, right? I don't know how, I don't know what, how much higher. That one definitely is okay, but you know, so if I had a sample difference that high, now my confidence interval is going to be centered around that value, and maybe it shifts enough to where I can say the calorie consumption went up after they posted the, the calories, or, or, you know, vice versa. The sample difference was lower, maybe I could say it decreased. But based off this, I have positive and negative values that the truth could be. I can't really make any claims at the 99% level. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, so, and then I always love this meme because it's like one of my favorite favorite movies in high school, Napoleon Dynamite. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's like a, I mean, it's a dumb movie. It's very dumb, but there's some great lines in it. So, uh, so let's do a hypothesis test with, with this exact same example, right? So same same information, you know, same setup, but this nutritionist wants to examine whether liquid calories have decreased after they posted this on the menu. Okay. So if we think about, when we're looking at this difference, this population difference, it really represents kind of this after minus the before. Okay. So if we want to know whether or not calories have decreased, that would mean that the after has to be higher than the before. So that would give us a difference that is, sorry, I said that backwards. If we want to know if it's decreased, after would have to be lower than before, right? We're kind of decreasing there. So my difference would have to be less than zero, right? If it's decreased, right, they were consuming more calories before than they were after they posted these calories. So we've got this, that's what we want to find, that's what we want to test for, so that's our alternative hypothesis. The null will be the exact opposite of that. So if our alternative hypothesis is that this true kind of mean difference is less than zero, right, decrease. The, the null, so that was our alternative, the null will be the exact opposite of the complement, which is that it's greater than or equal to. Okay. So we identify kind of the hypothesis in a similar way to what we're doing with two population examples, because, you know, even though this really is only one statistic, it's the mean of this difference variable. Remember, the difference variable represented kind of after minus before. Um, so what type of tilt test do we have here? If we look at the alternative hypothesis, there's a less than sign. So less than or left tail, right? So moving forward, uh, well, I'll skip this one because I want to think about, I'll come back to that. Oh, well, maybe I didn't put the slide up there. I think I did the p-value approach here. So let's do the critical value approach. I don't have a slide for this. What do I know is going to be true about the sign of my critical value? If I have a left tail test, my critical values are going to be the values that give me alpha in that left tail. So, we're working with a student p distribution, critical values that would give me alphas of 0.1 or 0.05 or 0.01 in that lower left tail. Well, I know that the mean of this distribution is centered around zero. My student T and the standard normal are both centered around zero. So if I want this area in the tail of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01, my critical value has to be negative. Okay. So I've got a left tail test. I can look these three critical values up. Okay. Now, if I use that student T table, it presents kind of the areas that are in, it kind of reminds us up here, in the right tail which is fine because this is a symmetric distribution. So if I find the kind of T values that would give me 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01 in the upper right tail, those same values would give me those areas in the left tail, but they'd have to be negative, okay? So I had what, 40 Starbucks card holders, so my degrees of freedom was 39. I wanted the 
area of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. All right, in my tail, so 1.304, 1.685, and 2.426, but those values, negative, right? Because we're dealing with a left tail test. So negative 1.304, negative 1.685, negative, did I skip a line? Negative 2.426, okay? So those would be our critical values. So let's see if I can remember them. One point. I'll approximate them, 1.3, 1.68, 2.4. We've got critical values, 1.30, 1.68, I think it was 2.42, approximately. We have a left tail test, so that's our rejection region of the left tail. So now what we need is our test statistic. Where does our test statistic fall against these critical values? Well, we had our test statistic equation, and you know, once we've identified that, it's, it's really as easy as kind of plugging in our values, right? We had the sample difference, our, our variance of that difference variable, sample size was 40. Once again, if we're looking at the test statistic equation, and I find a positive difference, okay? So, kind of a reminder, Right? And what we have here kind of is always zero. Or another way you can write this is kind of a mean difference, assume kind of mean difference. I think that's a little bit, I don't like that as much. So we'll just keep that kind of that assume true difference. I'm already getting this mixed up. So here was our test statistic equation. Remember, anytime we do a test statistic, you take the statistic you're interested in, subtract the assumed true value of that statistic, and divide by the standard deviation of that statistic. So this denominator represents the standard deviation of these sample differences. Okay? Well, if this is a standard deviation, we know it's always going to be positive. If we're assuming the true value is zero, well, then really, whatever sample difference we find tells us the sign of the test statistic. Right? We find a positive sample difference, that's going to be a certain number of standard deviations above the assumed true value. We found a negative sample difference, that's going to be a certain number of standard deviations below the assumed true value. So if we found 2.1 for our kind of sample difference, mean difference, we already know our test statistic has to be positive. So right away, we know it's either going to be B or D. Okay? From there, it's probably just a matter of we have to plug everything in. Remember that assumed true difference is zero, so there's, I mean, we could, I could add in. I wanted to be real uh, technically correct here. I could add in minus zero. That's not going to change anything, right? Subtracting that assumed true difference. And we get about 1.66. Any questions on, on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as long as not all four of them are positive, not all four of them are negative, right? Yeah, yeah no, but you could. Um, now, this only applies to kind of this mean difference. Um, if we go back to one population stuff, we were using, I mean, we don't have to use zero here, right? We, um, all the examples I'm going to give you, I'll use zero. But if we didn't, then things would change, right? If I, you know, here if I said, not only do I want to know have calories decreased, have they decreased by more than 20 calories? So there I'm thinking about, is that difference something that's negative 20 or a larger kind of negative value or, or kind of, you know, less than negative 20? Um, but the examples I'll give you, I'll kind of always give you zero there, which makes that kind of nice because you can tell the sign of the test statistic. And if we think a little bit more about why, you know, really what we're, so before I go there, so we have that test statistic. Also, all these were supposed to be negative, right? I just wrote the numbers up here, forgot the negative signs. Um, so we found 1.66 is way over here, not even close to the rejection region. And it kind of makes sense. This is one of those examples where if we just stop and take a second, we don't have to work through the entire example to make the rejection decision. Because if my null hypothesis was that that true difference is greater than or equal to zero, I found sample evidence that supports the null. So if it supports the null, for sure I'm not going to reject it, 
right? So right away, we, we should have known, I don't even have to go through the steps. I know I'm gonna to fail to reject this hypothesis, right? I found evidence that supports it, so why would I reject it? Right? Um, and so, you know, we could plot the, the critical values and we can see very clearly we would by far fail to reject, right? It was nowhere, nowhere near like that rejection region, okay? Any questions on that? Just to kind of remember, this is our kind of test statistic over here, or T, T statistic, not T test. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm already thinking about what we're about to do. Okay, so my test statistic is my T stat. Any more questions on that? Um, what if I ask you for the p value, or we want to take the p value approach? So it's going to be hard to use that student T table. Remember, we can only kind of put bounds on it. But if we just want to think about rejection decisions, what is this for a left tail test? This is going to be a weird one. But the p-value would be the probability we saw that or anything to the left. Right? So if we're thinking about our p-value being the area to the left, what do we know our p-value has to be greater than 8? Yep, because the area to the left of 0 would be 0.5. So the area of the left of 1.6 is something greater than 0.5. If we only reject when the p-value is less than alpha, well, if we're using alphas of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, and we know that our p-value is greater than 0.5, well, it's gonna be greater than all those by far, right? So we don't even have to find the exact p-value, but just thinking about the area that it would be in, we know our rejection decisions. Okay. All right. So, there's no questions. Okay. Let's go back to that two population HT blank file. Okay. So I've got this suicide kind of data sheet and I will show you, you know, the examples that I'll, I'll be using kind of on the, on the exam or you'll, you'll typically see are usually time example, right? What was the difference over time, okay? Um, I have kind of a weird one here. Um, we're not gonna be using time, but we can still have one, like one sample and looking for the difference in something. So I think we, did we go over this last class, me just showing you how I calculated this different, like creating this difference variable? I don't know if I did, so, might have been the other section. So I have all this, this county data, right? I have these different counties in different years. I then have kind of the number of suicides in each one of those counties. It's just sample data. I don't have every county in the US, but I have a lot of them. Okay. So I've got the same, like instead of like with a manager example, we have the same 10 people. Now we have the same counties. We're looking in within the same county within the same year. So let's take a difference between kind of male minus female number of suicides. Okay. So I'm gonna enter. Then to do this for every single observation, instead of like dragging it down to like copy it, you'll notice if I go to this little, this, well, I don't really want this guy here, but it's fine. There's a little green box in the lower right corner. Notice how my mouse becomes a like little black plus sign. If I double left click, it will essentially drag that all the way to the bottom of the data set for me. Okay. So that's kind of a nice little trick in Excel if you want to create a column that has the same thing, you can double left click on that. So now I have this difference variable, right? I can find the mean of this difference variable. Control shift or command shift down arrow. I can find the variance, so var.s, right? It's just a sample of this difference variable. And then I can count, use the count function to find my sample size. So it's just like we were doing with, with kind of the other examples, find the sample mean, find the sample variance, find the sample size. But now we only have one population and the mean we found represents the mean of this difference variable. Okay. So if we go back and we look at, where do we have the other one? There it is, our test statistic equation. We're just gonna enter this into Excel, right? Use Excel to be our calculator. Now I put that assume true value of zero up there. I said, we'll always kind of use that, that assume true difference of zero. But just to be complete, I'm gonna 
take my sample, whoops, what did I forget? My equal sign. I'm going to put that sample mean difference minus that assumed true difference, okay, divide by the square root of my sample variance divided by my sample size. Now, you don't have to use that assumed true difference if it's zero, but I want to show you something in a second where what would it look like if it wasn't zero. But for the examples that I kind of gave you on the Excel assignment, the hypothesis, hypothesized true value should be zero there. So you would just plug zero, or you don't have to, minus zero doesn't change anything. Okay, so I'll hit enter, right? Now I've got my test statistic. Okay. So my p value, if I think about, Let's say I want to do, um, I think I have this in the slide set up a certain way because I actually kind of say what we're doing here. Let's, uh, we want to test for whether or not there's a difference, right? So let's do a two-tailed test, right? That kind of lines up with, with what's in the slide there. So we want, we got, what, 39 is our test statistic? What we're really saying is, I found this test statistic of 39. I want the area to the right of it, but it would have been equally as likely for a two-tailed test to see something 39 standard deviations below the assumed difference on the other side, right? So kind of each of these areas represent half my p-value. So if I find one of these areas, I need to multiply by two to get my total p-value. So how do we do that in Excel? Well, there are two different ways. Okay. So the first is we could use that t dot dist, right? I could say, well, I want to find the area to the right of this test statistic with this degrees of freedom, so sample size minus one. Right? But then remember, comma one, I can only use this t dot dist to find the area to the left. So if this is going to give me the area to the left, of a test statistic of 39, what else do I need to add in here? This is the area to the left, we have the area to the right, which is what we, what we wanted, right? I simply take the area to the left and subtract it from one. Okay. Now I also said it's a two-tailed test. So once I find that area, so I'll put parentheses around that, that's only half my p-value, so I would need to multiply it by two. Okay. Now, this is one way of doing it. Right. I pretty much get a p-value of zero, which kind of makes sense. That's a really big test statistic, right? 39. Um, I could have also used this t dot dist dot two t function. I could tell that my test statistic and my degrees of freedom and it will essentially kind of do all that work for me. It'll kind of subtract, you know, look for the area to the left, subtract from one, then multiply it by two. Now, one thing that we'll have to use in here, and I'm just going to, it wouldn't matter in this example, um, but I'll show you why it would matter. Well, actually here, let's just say we take the test statistic that we want, degrees of freedom, which is my sample size minus one. Right? So this will do all the work for me. Notice it gets a, a little bit closer to, I mean, it's still, right? This is 231. Uh, things are right. So let me see if we format these the same. Uh, no, it, it's just a little bit off. Sample size minus one, one minus. I mean, these are both essentially zero. We'll see these line up when I get values that are a little bit further from zero. I think it just has something to do with the the formatting. There's probably some rounding that occurs in in one of these, right? pre-programmed. Um, but you know, either way, we're getting the exact same p-value, which is essentially zero. Okay. Now, the problem is, let's say this was, and I don't, don't change this on yours. I'm just going to show you for the sake of this example. So let's say this was negative 39. It'd be the same approach, right? If I have a test statistic of negative 39, I should have found the area to the left and then multiplied it by two, right? So it should be kind of the, the exact same thing. Oops. But notice that t dot test t dot dist dot two t doesn't work for that because it can only take 
the absolute value of a test statistic, right? For whatever reason, I, I don't know why they couldn't have added one more line of code that says, you know, if it's negative, just, you know, take the absolute value, but it can't, right? So now we had, or we get kind of approximately zero there. So if we want to, so I just undid all those changes. If we want to, even if we have a positive value, just kind of remember, if we take the absolute value of that test statistic in this t.dist.2t function, it'll always work, whether it's negative or positive. So that might just be kind of a fail safe to make sure we're not getting that error. Okay. So um, that's kind of one way. So we can find the test statistic, use these functions to find the p-value, or, right, if I would have used this t dot test function that we had talked about last class, when we were looking at the difference in sample means with only sample variances, I can use it to do matched pairs as well. So what did I want to find the difference between? Well, the first one was male suicide. So t dot test, I'll select that male variable, right? So then scroll back up here so I can show this to you. All right, oh, get out of the way. I'll then put a comma. The second array that I selected, well, what did I, I took the male minus the female suicides. So the second array of data I'll select is the female variable. Okay. So we can see that. Comma. How many tail tests do I have? Two. Okay. Comma. What type of test do I want to perform? Well, before we were doing this option three, which was kind of two samples that didn't have the same variance. Now we're doing a matched pairs example or a paired example, right? So that's going to be option one. Okay. And it should, like I said, you know, it kind of asks you the questions here, but kind of that's the order. Select, you know, what am I looking at the difference between male minus the female, number of tails, and then the final thing is kind of what type of example do we have? In this case, we have a matched pairs, so I'm going to put a one there. Okay. Any questions on that, or you want to see something again, or okay with that? So if I hit enter here, notice I'm getting kind of the the exact same p-value. Right. Okay. Um, you know, which is great. Let's, it's a great kind of shortcut to be able to use. I didn't have to create this whole new column. Excel did that behind the scenes, right? I didn't have to calculate my test statistic or figure out which one of these ways do I want to try to find the p-value. It just does all that for me. Right? Now the problem is similar with the other examples, right? If I change this to something like, uh, what was my difference? Okay. Let's say I want to know, is the difference something other than 20, right? Well, you know, everything there updated, kind of, but this isn't, right? This guy right here can only use that assumed true difference of zero, okay? But if we have an assumed true difference of zero, that's fine, right? Where is this one? Yeah, this. Anyways, so I'm going to show you something here real quick. We could do our rejection decisions, right? If this p-value is less than alpha, comma, put in the word reject, comma, if it's not, put in the word, word fail to reject. Okay. And I want to keep using the same cell reference for my p-value here. Okay. So I'm going to freeze that cell. Right, so that when I drag this down, I keep using the same p-value, but it updates my alpha reference. Okay. So if I do that here, no surprise, this p-value, right, e to the negative 231 is zero, so I'm going to reject at every level, right? It's going to be less than every single alpha. But if I want to be able to re reject some other values, like, I don't know, is it different than 30? And I need to change this so that I'm not using this one because it won't update when I show you this example. Let's use uh, cell P7, right? So I'll use this one here, which can update even if we're not using that assumed true difference of zero. 
Yep, I can actually, with the, the evidence I found, reject that the difference in male and female suicides is different than 30. In fact, what probably makes more sense here is to probably set this up as a right-tailed test. I, I would be able, able to say that I can reject, you know, that the, the true difference um, is actually uh, not less than or equal to 30, right? It's something greater than 30. Okay. What about 40? I can still reject. What about 43? Can't, can't reject that, right? My, my sample mean difference is a little bit too close. 42, I can reject with 90, 95%. 41, I can actually go back to rejecting all, right? So, you know, I'm not going to give you examples where I give you anything other than zero for these matched pairs, but we could do that, right? And if I had set this up as a one-tail test, you know, I can start to say that I can reject that the true different or that kind of male, uh, I can, if I assume that the true difference between male and female suicides was let's say 40 or less, right? I actually could reject that the true difference is somewhere below 40. And that in fact, the true difference is you know, likely something above 40, right? Based off the sample evidence I found here, which is a pretty big statement. We're doing this by county. You know, if the, if the, the mean difference is 40, 40 additional suicides of men per county, multiply that by the number of the counties in the US, that's a, a much higher number of, of kind of male suicides and female suicides, right? Um, so maybe a, may, maybe something that, uh, you know, a politician or a policymaker would want to kind of target. Okay? Any questions over anyone want to see any of this again? Let me change this back to zero just so you can kind of see. Click on a cell again, any questions on that? Yeah. Yep. Last class we used. Uh, where would it have been? Here it is. Option three, right? We had C. So when it says type, show me the types. There we go. So option three was two samples where the variances weren't the same. Right? We had sample variances, but they weren't the same. Which will, I mean, always kind of be the case. So we used option three there last class. Can you show me the way to know that without typing in the wrong That the variances aren't equal? Um, so, so really what that means, I, <laughs> they're kind of outside of this class is, so like, I've been kind of referring to it as though it's your sample variances because those give you a good idea, especially with sample sizes this large, about whether the population differences would be different. In practice, if I had small samples, I'm really making an assumption. I'm saying, based off of, I don't know, some other data set or based off of what I know about this process or what I know about kind of, you know, the differences I see between kind of male and female, I don't know, other biological characteristics, that maybe I, I would believe that there are differences in the variances across these two, across genders in this example, right? If it was something like, I'm gonna guess here, I'm not a biologist, but I think this one would be a good example. If I was doing like a, um, if I was doing a like mean, uh, what would be a good one for it? Something that like wouldn't vary across the genders where the population variances I would think would be the same. I could have chose option two there. It's just, we're, I mean, we're just never having examples where that's likely gonna be the case that the two different populations have the exact same variance, right? Um, so yeah, just always kind of use option three when we're looking at the difference in means there yeah. for the sake of this class. Not necessarily a two-tailed test. When we use that match pair example, that's when we kind of were thinking about, we only have one sample here, right? Back here, I had a male data set where I calculated BMI and a female data set. Those were completely different individuals in both, in both samples, right? Here, I've got the same counties. I've just got this, how many you know, male suicides and female suicides in that same county. So I only have one population. I'm still looking for the difference in those things, but because it's one population, right? Now I know that I'm kind of looking at this matched pair. Does that make, kind of clarify? Okay. Any other questions? 
All right. Um, so that should be everything you need. Uh, I'll, I'll you know, I have the kind of completed file already up there, but I might have done a couple additional things in this one. So I'll post this on, on Canvas as well now that we're kind of completed with it. It should have everything you need to kind of get through that Excel assignment, um, which is due the Friday after Thanksgiving break. Okay. All right. So let me introduce kind of this next idea to you in the last few minutes here. So it's going to look like we're doing hypothesis tests, but I won't do a ton, right? Or we won't do like as much as we were doing before. So we don't have to just use, we can use hypothesis tests for any statistic. I think at one point in the semester, I even mentioned to you, you know, we've got Z statistics and T statistics that come from standard normal and student T distributions. There's also F statistics. We can use an F distribution, like there's chi squared. There's a bunch of different stuff, right? We're not gonna do all that. But we could do things for statistics like, what's the correlation coefficient, right? If we only had a sample correlation coefficient, we could do a hypothesis test that based off the coefficient we found, what's the true relationship between these two variables, what X and Y? Up to this point, we've really only looked at one variable, right? Like what's the you know, distribution of this one variable? Well, here, we can start to understand the relationship between two variables, right? If we go back, you know, we kind of remember when we had these covariances or these correlation coefficients, if they were positive, that told us that as X goes up, Y also goes up. If they were negative, as X goes up, Y tends to go down. If it's zero, as X goes up, Y doesn't change, right? So what we're gonna do is do something a little bit better than these correlation coefficients. We're gonna try to estimate kind of this linear, what we call a linear regression, use a linear regression to understand what's the relationship between X and Y. Okay? So why would this help me understand the relationship between X and Y? So if I'm thinking about I mean, this is kind of, I, you know, it might seem very simple. I don't know. This is kind of like, I don't know what math level this would be, but it's, it's not tough, right? I remember like, th these are on like, are you guys are like I step a lot of you probably from Indiana. We had to take, uh, we took something in like eighth grade when I was in Michigan. I don't know what, the, what they called it, but it, I remember like specifically that these were on there, right? So um, if I think about this y equals a plus b times x, that's just the equation of a line, right? If I have X here and Y here, if X is zero, what would Y be? Well, zero times anything would just be A, right? So here's my intercept. And then B tells me that if X goes up by one unit, what's the value of Y? Well, then it would just be A plus from zero to one, one times B, right? And I kind of plot out the rest of my line where I know the slope of this line is B and kind of where it starts out at is A. So if I could use data to somehow get like, I don't know, let's say this is income and uh, uh, years of education, right? What's the return on one additional kind of year of education? Well, you know, if I can somehow get an idea about what this estimate is, that helps me out if I'm thinking about investing into like taking another year of, of getting another year of education. So we can use this kind of tool called linear regression to obtain estimates for what those are. Now it's gonna be based off sample data, so they're still only estimates, right? They're like sample estimates of what those relationships are, but they're still kind of giving us like the best, best idea or the best guess. So, right? Some of the terms that I'll start using is when we think about this line, that variable Y on the left-hand side, I'm gonna call like my dependent variable, my left-hand side variable, or like my Y variable, okay? Whatever variable I'm using on the right, that's my X variable, my independent variable, right? It, it's, it's not being changed by Y, it's what is changing Y. That's why Y is dependent on X, right? It's a function of X, essentially. It's a linear function, but it's still a function of X. So our independent, our X, or our kind of right-hand side variable, okay? We'll then use regression analysis to understand or get an estimate for what that slope coefficient would be between X and Y, or what that slope B would be, right? Okay? So, you know, another way to think about this, just to introduce the idea of trying to estimate this line, 
if I tried to draw a line that best, like this is data, right? If I had a data set where I had two variables, X and Y, I could create a scatter plot. This goes all the way back to like week one, week two, right? If I try to draw a line of best, that best fits this data, right? So let's say I draw this line. Well, here's its intercept A, and then whatever its slope ends up being, that's my value for B. So based off having this data, like if I look at this scatter plot, and I, if I could draw the line that best fits this data, that would give me, this data would give me an estimate for what the intercept and what that slope be between this X and Y variable would be. Now, in practice, we can't just like look at the data and like draw a line through it, right? So we're gonna have to kind of go through some steps to figure out how we can get that estimate. But that's essentially what we're doing. Big picture, we're trying to get a line that if I drew it through a scatter plot of my data would best fit this data, okay? So you can think about here, what would the slope, what's the slope of B? I know that it's less than zero, right? It's negative, right? This is a downward sloping line. I could then go through other examples, right? This one has a slope that's pretty much, well, this slope actually is zero, right? As X goes up here, Y doesn't change at all on this line. I could then think about here, I've got B would be positive. I have an upward sloping line. I kind of thought about this one earlier, but like a negative sloping line here, B is negative, right? We can do nonlinear relationships, right? We're not gonna do that in this class, um, but if we kind of kept going with what we're gonna learn, we could do that as well. But for us, we're just gonna keep it kind of trying to estimate these linear relationships. So we're gonna kind of leave it there and just introduce this idea to learn smart. We'll kind of get you a little bit further into some of these linear regression ideas and then we'll pick back up on this on Monday. I will be here kind of recording Monday. Um, I'll have the Zoom um, if you wanna sign on or if you wanna show up in person, like I said, I'll be here. So um, feel free to kind of, kind of show up, okay? All right, have a good weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday.